This is an RCA channelist. It was originally developed by Ryder, that is the John, John F. Ryder Company, and later the rights to build these were acquired by RCA. What this is intended to do is uh, test radios of the 1930s and 1940s. It came out in the late 30s, if I recall correctly. I'll look a little later and make sure of that. But uh, this is the RCA model. The model before this was made by Ryder and would, of course, had RCA or Ryder's name on it. But you notice that they still call it a Ryder channelist, even though it says over here it's made by the Radio Corporation of America. And that's because Ryder was a rather famous name in the 30s and in the 40s and even into the 50s in radio and later into television. So what I'm going to be doing, I restored this unit partially uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I bought it from a radio friend who was closing out a large supply of old radios and old radio test equipment. And I partially restored it, that is, electrically got it kind of working. One thing I didn't bother with was the meter. I don't know if I'm going to try to fix that meter or not. They're really hard to work on. I used to work on meters, but frankly, uh, that was back in the days when my eyesight was uh, good enough to do jewelry, and today I'm not sure that it is. So I may leave the meter alone, but I mainly want to check that this still works and restore any or repair anything that needs to be done to it. And then what I'd like to do is actually use it uh, on an old uh, 1930s radio in the restoration work for the purpose of showing how this would have been used in the day. Now, I will point out that the uh, <laughs> this is really kind of pointless in the day of modern oscilloscopes and so on. And in fact, just an ordinary signal tracer probably will do 90% of what this unit will do. But nonetheless, it's an interesting piece of vintage equipment that a lot of people may have never seen. So I'll take a look at that and let's, uh, let's get some stuff out and take a look at what's inside this thing. Here it is out of the case. It's rather easy to remove. There are just a series of screws around the outside of the front panel. And then there's one in the back that holds it, uh, hold it in the case. Once you have those removed, it just slides out, as you can see here. So before we start looking at the actual uh, circuitry of this, I think it might help if I kind of gave you an overview of what this instrument was designed to do or what its functions are. So let me do, try that next. On the left is the Rider Channelist or RCA Rider Channelist manual. You can download this from, I think it's the Boat Anchor Manuals Archive. You know, look for that on the web as just BAMA Manuals, B-A-M-A. -A. On the right is an ad that appeared in Radio Electronics back in January of 1949, it looks like. And for the uh, 162C, which is what this one is. So, the uh, we'll look at, uh, uh, not the ad, but the manual a little later as we're uh, going through the various circuits. But uh, for right now, what I'm going to do, I put together this uh, channelist brochure. This was a kind of a marketing brochure and also a sort of introduction to uh, to the channelist that, uh, pardon the light, uh, that was given out fairly freely by RCA salesmen back in the day. And it provides a pretty good overview. So what I'm going to do is pull the pages out of this and show you a little bit of what the channelist does and cross-reference from that document over to the front panel of the channelist so you can kind of get familiar with the features and functions of the uh, this particular instrument. The channelist is basically a signal tracer and by that what I mean is it uh, it's a tuned signal tracer. It has sections for tuning a pair of 
actually audio amplifiers. Well, in one case, there's a detector also. But basically, uh, the idea is that you can trace a signal using this from the beginnings of a radio that is near the antenna all the way back to the speaker. And you can do that not with a broadband signal tracer, like uh, actually replace this unit, but you can actually tune it sharply so that, for example, you can listen to just the IF frequency or just a particular RF frequency. And so it's considerably more complicated than what might have been called a signal tracer of the day. It uses four uh, seeing eye tubes and a meter, which is somewhat unusual, but the purpose was you could be monitoring four different signals on the, uh, on the eye tubes while at the same time measuring something on the meter. Uh, the meter was an early vacuum tube voltmeter, and some of these other controls we'll talk about when we, when we get there, but it also includes a watt meter the, uh, so that you can measure how much uh, power that the radio is consuming, which was an important feature. One of the things that's particularly unique about this unit, however, is that the amplifiers were calibrated, somewhat calibrated, so that you could use it to measure, for example, the gain of an IF stage or the conversion uh, efficiency of a mixer and things of that sort. Uh, a little bit later, when we look at RCA radios from that period, you'll see that RCA took advantage of this fact and, in fact, published gain figures in their uh, service manuals. But uh, we'll get to that when we get a little further along in all of this. Let's now look at the different parts of this in just a little bit more detail. The Basically, this is what each section looks like. There's a probe that you use to uh, pick up signals, an attenuator network, and then a series of amplifiers with tuning that e eventually result in what they call a rectifier here. Or you might also call that a detector. In other words, it's basically a, something that converts a modulated AM signal to a, an audio signal, and, and in this particular case, it also converts it to DC, to a DC level, or at least to a very slowly varying uh, DC level that is applied to the CNI tube. Here it's called an electron ray indicator. Basically, it's a 65. Okay, that is the RF IF channel. In other words, that's how you mount monitor everything from the RF through the IF. The next channel is called the oscillator channel, and this is the way you could determine whether the oscillator was uh, running, and if it was, whether it was tracking across the entire band. That is, you could tune the, uh, the channelist to the oscillator, and then, uh, as you adjusted the oscillator, you could retune the channelist to show that the oscillator was, in fact, following the, uh, uh, tracking the band. This is how the, uh, the oscillator circuit is made. And, once again, an attenuator network uh, off of a probe into an amplifier. Notice that there are fewer amplifiers. In fact, there's only one stage of amplification because the oscillator is a much stronger signal. Then, once again, it's rectified and applied to a you know, tuning eye or a seeing eye tube, whatever. The third channel is called the audio channel, and that is just basically an amplifier that converts an AF signal to a DC or slowly varying DC signal that can be applied to the electron ray indicator. Uh, this is somewhat like the AC channel of a vacuum tube voltmeter, except instead of showing on a meter, it displays on the uh, on the eye tube. The, the next uh, section is the electronic voltmeter, which is basically just a VTVM, that is a vacuum tube voltmeter. It has a probe and a, and a divider network 
to adjust the input level and then you uh, apply the signal to a, an electronic voltmeter and an, uh, an amplifier bridge circuit with a meter. And finally, it has the wattage indicator. That is, you plug the unit in to the uh, uh, front panel connector and that uh, you adjust a control until you get a balance on the uh, the I-tube, at which time you know how much wattage the unit is uh, is consuming. So, uh, as you can tell, the rest of this note is uh, uh, war stories, if you will. Uh, practical application as told by a channelist owner, and so on. The uh, and some more more marketing kind of material, uh, applications of uh, things. Uh, you can see the signal. Of course, in those days, oscilloscopes were not as popular as they are today, although you can see one in the upper right-hand corner. But uh, the channelist was a way for people of the day who were a little less sophisticated, perhaps, than today's service people to... Uh, to visualize what was going on inside a radio, and once again another another war story, uh, an article on how to uh, test for intermittent reception, and so on, and eventually we get to the schematic, which we will be examining in more detail. Now, if you would like to follow along on all of this, one thing you might want to do is download the manual from the Bama Archive, and uh, I think you can find it under Writer. It may be under RCA, but at any rate, it's called a Channelist. Uh, and uh, if you remember how that was spelled, the it's C H A N A L Y S T. So let's uh, start digging into this unit and see what we have and what we might need to repair or to restore before we can uh, use it in a practical application. I've brought the power up and as you can see the uh, the electron ray indicators as they call them, the the uh, eye tubes are all uh, glowing. Uh, once again, I haven't checked this in, in a couple of years, so I don't know what still works and what doesn't. But uh, the current draw, as you can see, is on that uh, Syncor uh, variable isolation transformer. And that's the 1.75 amp range, so it's a uh, relatively low amount of uh, power. And... The next thing we'll do is we'll start uh, probing inside this thing, checking voltages and a few things like that. And as soon as I'm satisfied that everything is is in fairly good condition, well, we'll try to maybe fire this uh, up uh, with a radio and do a little signal tracing. Now I've set up the uh, channelist to uh, demonstrate how the RF-IF section works. I built a probe. When I first got this unit, it didn't have any probes. So I built a probe. In fact, I built a number of probes. The uh, They have this old-fashioned uh, phono or headphone uh, plug to them. Uh, and, and then on this end, I have a very, very tiny capacitor between this point and the center of the coax cable here. Now, I'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. But basically what that does is it provides very little loading to a circuit. In fact it's only a, a two or so picofarad capacitor. Up here on the uh, generator I have a uh, modulated sine wave, a 1 megahertz modulated sine wave with a 1 kilohertz modulation. And it's right now coming out on channel 1 here. Now, 
as you will notice, what you are hearing is the output of the channelist tuned to 1 megahertz, and what you're hearing is the 1 kilohertz modulation. In other words, this, the channelist, is working as a receiver tuned to 1 megahertz. That's what you see there on the dial. And then down here, you see that I have the sensitivity set to the 10 position and the gain control set to about 0.3 or just below 0.3. Now, up here on the, uh, the iTubes, you can see when I touch now, you notice that the eye closes slightly. And I can tune it. Now I'm going to lower the gain. Okay. Now, you see, because I have tuned it more precisely, the gain has now been raised all the way to the 10 position. Now, if you think about this, this is actually the reverse of a normal volume control. This is actually more of an attenuator. In other words, when I was at 0.3, I was attenuating it by 0.3. When I'm at 10, I'm attenuating it by 10. In other words, think of this as like divide by 10, the signal, or divide by 0.3. Uh, once again, this is the coarse gain control, and this is the fine gain control, and then this control selects the band. That is, whether it's band A, B, or C on the tuning dial. And right now I have it on uh, band C, which is basically the AM broadcast band, and at the center is approximately 1 megahertz. So we'll go back to the signal again. And there you can hear it. By the way, the, uh, the signal that you're hearing is coming out of this output. This is the RFIF output and is being connected up there and I'm using the Syncor PA81 just as a, 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 an audio amplifier to drive a speaker so that I can hear what's going on and also I can if I want to read the RMS voltage out. In fact maybe we might want to we might want to do that. I'm going to go ahead and touch that again. And you notice that it uh, read the, the voltage and swung up, uh, actually the auto ranging uh, raised it to a, a higher level and so on. So basically all I'm doing here is sort of demonstrating how the RFIF uh, section works. I'm saving the actual application of this to a future video where I can actually apply this to a, to a 1930s style radio. But nonetheless, this is how the uh, unit works. The only other thing that I'm going to demonstrate is the, uh, well, I may, I may demonstrate the audio feature, but the IF feature, of course, is the same. You just tune to the IF. On the other side over here is the oscillator, and that's a lower gain device. I suspect, however, that that one will work just as well. I've tested it. It does work. So let me set up to, to do uh, one more thing on this, and then I think what I'm going to do is wrap up this video as sort of the introduction to the channelist, because it appears to be working as it did a couple of years ago when I finished restoring it. And except for the meter, which I still haven't uh, tried to fix, the... Uh, all the functions, to, at least to me, appear to be working. So let me set up for one more uh, demonstration and then I think it's time for us to move on. Now I have jumpered the RF IF output, that is the audio, the output from the detector of the RF IF stage, 
down to the AF input, that is the audio frequency amplifier input. The AF amplifier gain is set by this control. And so once again, I'm going to touch the generator with the one kilohertz modulated signal. And attenuate the audio signal or amplify it. as the case may be. And so, as you can tell, you not only can jumper the RF to the AF input, but of course you can input an, R an AF signal here, for example, off of the volume control of a radio to see what the quality of the audio is, and then monitor it here with a set of headphones, etc. Now, of course, I could use headphones here but then you wouldn't be able to hear it on the camera, which is the reason why that I'm using the PA81 to drive a loudspeaker. This actually matches a 600 ohm headphone, which I have one pair of uh, mono 600 ohm headphones, but most of the headphones I have are stereo anyway. But nonetheless, this is where you would monitor the output. Uh, the oscillator section over here works exactly the same. That is, it is tunable and the uh, input is at the far right, same kind of connection, different probe, however. And in fact, uh, let me uh, take a look at that, at those probes before I, uh, before I close this particular video. Here is the schematic of the channelist again, and over on this side you see that this is the little interconnect cable that I was using to connect from the RF-IF output to the AF input. It's just two headphone, jack, headphone plugs that plug into the headphone jacks on the front panel and, and jumper from the, the output of one stage to the input of another. Then to the left of that is the test probe for the voltmeter, it's just a one meg resistor in series with the line. This is the audio probe and it's just a straight connection. This is the one that's a little tricky, it's the RF-IF probe and the reason is there's a very small capacitor here but, it, but the capacitor value is not specified. Well, it turns out that if you search around online, you'll find that the people who have done a more, lot more research on these units than me have determined that that capacitor is about two to three picofarads. Well, the way that I made uh, my probe, which has about two picofarads of capacitance, is I just brought one wire in like this finger and leaving the insulation on that wire, I just laid another wire alongside it like this, going off in the other direction. So basically all I was doing is uh, using the insulation of two pieces of wire. One of the wires is the center conductor of this coax cable because it is important that you keep this shielded up as close to that capacitor as you can. And so the last about inch of that coax cable is buried inside the test probe and then the test probe uh, end has a wire soldered to it that just lays alongside that coax and, and I don't remove the insulation from that last little bit of coax. So that's how I built mine. I don't know how the original one was built but it certainly seems to work fine. And before I close out Earlier I told you that RCA, after they started using or building the Channelist, started using gain figures in their radio diagrams. And here is an example of a radio. I just happen to have this one. And you notice that it shows the gain is shown up here between each stage. That is, this is a gain of 0.8x, this is a gain of 50,000, and, uh, or I'm sorry, 50x, not 50,000. 
50x and so on. And that's the reason why that you use those eye tubes. In other words, what you do is you, you use the volume control to bring the eye just closed. Then you go to the next stage and you use the coarse and fine to close the needle again and then you look at the difference between the two and you multiply them. So for example, if, uh, let, me, let me show you that on the front panel. So for example, here the coarse is set to 10 and the fine is set to about 0.3. Now let's suppose you went through a stage and to bring the eye back to just closed, you had to go, say, to the next stage over. That is 10 times as much to the 100 stage. That means that that stage, uh, that stage has a gain of more than 10. And then suppose that you had to adjust this to, say, the 0.5 position. So in other words, you went from 0.3 to 0.5. So you would multiply the 10 times the 2 here, and you would know that your uh, stage gain between those two points was 20. And then, of course, you would simply compare that to what the schematic uh, reads. Or, if you uh, worked in a shop like I worked in, a lot of these values were written down, even for radios not made by RCA. So you would go to that book, if you will, or that, uh, that database today is what they would call it, and you would look up what the gain of that stage was supposed to be. That's one of the major advantages of the tuned amplifier or signal tracer to the non-tuned. Since the noise is pretty much rejected, you can do a pretty good job of determining stage gain with a channelist. Whereas with a regular signal tracer, you can get some relative idea, but you really can't compare one radio to another very easily because as the IF varies or, the, or other things change, uh, the noise level and so on, you get all kinds of varying readings. Plus, most signal tracers of the day had a very rudimentary uh, indicator system. They didn't have a, a very sensitive uh, seeing eye system like the uh, channelist. So, that's where I'm going to leave off talking about the channelist and uh, in this video, but I hope to pick up in a future video using this channelist in uh, the actual restoration of a vintage 1930s radio. So I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you'll look forward to some more of these in the future.